Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Thought Leaders. I'm your host, Chris Shang, where we bring in different types of leaders from various fields of expertise. And today is a very interesting one because we have Jason Bloomer, uh, CEO of Bloomer & Associates, but he's a CPA uh, that works with various types of agencies around scalability, growth, um, and building up their businesses, which I'm very curious to learn more about. Jason, I don't want to mess it up or, or, mm -hmm. or, or you know, chop it up in any way, but why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and and what, you know, what kind of companies you work with? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Chris, for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. Uh, so my partner and I, um, we've been together for a decade and I've been leading our firm for over 20 years. And really we have two different businesses. So one is a community-based business where we do conferences, programs, curriculum-based teaching, and that's around entrepreneurship. The other one is Blummer CPAs. That is our firm, our virtual firm. We've been virtual for about 12 years. And we've probably focused on agencies, started in the creative space, you know, designers, you know, marketers, things like that, and kind of moved into agencies probably over the past 15 years. Um, so and there's a long journey through through that that becomes consulting. But we were a traditional firm, just, you know, the accounting tax payroll for the small business. My dad started it 25 years ago. And then I came in really as an entrepreneur, just always trying new things. I've tried other, you know, digital marketing type businesses myself and uh, those failed. So <laughs> that was, that was, that was early on to try to, you know, figure out this journey, but it's a lot more fun to, to consult with other people. So we are a full service firm, BlummerCPAs.com. And our team does a lot of the financial work and advisory, but it was, just over time, we got more and more into consulting, mainly my partner and I do the consulting. And it's all about really um, an the agency owner, that founder, how they scale, how they scale a services-based company and a lot of the complexities that come with that. I'm actually writing a book right now about some of those those complexities because it is so so difficult to scale a services-based company. So and so just we got into consulting. Just through through trying different things, trying consulting, you know, and now we've gotten to a place where our consulting follows a pretty strong pattern of assessment that really pulls out a lot of, you know, insights that we teach on. Uh, then we go through retreats, typically uh, tr some kind of transformation. That's typically team structure, transformation, uh, sometimes uh, leadership team deployment. And then we go into coaching. Sometimes our consulting can be like a year or two years, just depending. So. That's kind of our journey. Got it. And when you say kind of the consulting part of it, what does that entail? Like outside of obviously, I think the traditional like, you know, CPA, finance and accounting. Yeah. Kind of things, yeah. Yeah. So it um, it can involve financial, you yeah. know, financial aspect. It doesn't always. So a lot of times we're actually working with a company that's bogged down in some way. So they're trying to grow. They've bogged down. And all fair, Chris, you and I were talking about a lot of times those owners get in their own way. So we do. So a lot of what we do with service based entrepreneurs is work through their own issues, their own lenses. You know, so we employ a lot of psychology, uh, coaching and consulting, those kind of things. We study the neuroscience of the mind and how we apply that in coaching. Uh, so a lot of times we're, we're pushing through. Uh, just troubles that the owner sometimes has caused uh, in and of themselves. So consulting is going to be um, assessing the company. So there's a there's an assessment phase that might be one to two months. Uh, that's surveying and one on one interviews. These are confidential. Uh, and then we come away with pattern based scoring that teach us insights. And from the insights, we give our consultative opinions. Uh, here's the things you need to fix. And through a lot of that process already up to that point, we're learning the owners and how they interact with consultants, how they trust us. Uh, and we start to pinpoint how they're leading or failing to lead. And of course, as consultants, we're, we're a third party to that company. So we're not bound by a lot of the emotional weight that they mm -hmm. carry. Uh, and so we, we're, you know, we, we're very direct and caring and kind, but very truthful, uh, so we take them through a process of how to start interacting with a third party consultant and how that feels. Sometimes it can feel uh, difficult because somebody is now, you know, <laughs> pushing things in their face that they may ignore, things they may not have seen. Uh, and when we go through that, when they're ready to start growing in that way, then we'll take them through retreats 
And typically that involves some kind of teaching. So we have some business models that we use for service-based entrepreneurs. They have a, they're a little traction-esque, you mm-hmm. know, little, little EOS uh, influence, but it's specifically for service-based companies trying to scale. And we'll teach those concepts and then we'll start working through the retreat. Here are the things you're going to change how you're going to deploy that into your company, which starts to disrupt that company, how you're going to message and communicate that. And then we coach them through the process of team starting to struggle with seeing this company change. And you start to identify legacy team, legacy processes, legacy client bases, and you have to fight through those, tear some of those down, uh, fight through some of those. And so we walk through all of that with them, trying to get this organization to become what it's supposed to be at the at the size it is, uh, because a lot of the consulting is about you you haven't built and transformed and changed your service organization soon enough. It, these things have to change and morph over time, and that's hard to know how to do. So we kind of have to catch them up and say you're you got the wrong business model. It's it it you can't run this big a company on that kind of structure. So we have to Im- implement leadership layers. How do you teach leaders to lead mm-hmm. process? You know, just a lot of things. So it could get, it could get into many different things to help them scale. Yeah. And, and when you say um, it, it feels like there's certain size, uh, maybe it's like different types of agencies, meaning it could be creative, it can be digital, it can be what have you, but is there a certain size of companies that you kind of tend to work with where they're dealing with this growth? Yeah. Yeah. So if, if around, um, if around 15 to 20 people, they haven't really identified a lot of their structure and they start to work in very productive structures, they're going to start to bog down around that time. So a lot of our consulting really hits home around the 40 to 50 team member size. Yeah. And that's just, that's just a way to bucket service-based companies, you know, by team size. Yeah. It's not a perfect way to do it, but um, we've seen so many patterns we can go we can go to their website, their team page on the website. And by the time they have 40 people, we can look at the team and we can see the titles and Mm. we can start to go. They don't have appropriately titled people. Mm. I need to see these departments titled. I need to see leadership. I need to see productive people in these departments. So, you know, by the time they're hitting 20, 30 people, they have to departmentalize in some way. They have to start splitting up into strategy, design, you know, media. They have to really go hard into those departments with leaders of those. And and if they're not doing that, we're starting to see, oh, okay, you're bogging down. Your structure's not even set up appropriately. Um, And so we, we just... You know, we just start working through that team structure to make sure knowledge can start moving through it and deliverables can start pushing through that organization. Interesting. So I'm curious, like um, that kind of off service offering feels vastly different from, I would say, like the traditional um personality type and trait of what you imagine like the typical CPA to be right. like. Yeah. Right, because you're talking about psychological uh, psychological mm. bearings and yeah. how to communicate with people in a certain way, right? Mm. Uh, which is, I think a lot of the time the biggest challenges with growth is sure. is, is is not that uh, people don't know what to do. It's almost communicating it in a way that they feel comfortable to do. Yeah. Uh, and so when when did this? I know you had came in and you know, you kind of took over this legacy business from your father, but like, mm. you know, that started off as the foundational element of it, doing that, the the primary, you know, the primary service function of yeah. being a CPA. But then was it through like intention or was it through almost like through osmosis of like seeing these repeated patterns where you're like, oh, interesting. Yeah. And, and then started to, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. what was the epiphany of like, hey, this is something else that we could be doing here. Was yeah. it through like learn just kind of seeing repeated patterns? Yeah. Uh, at a certain time or like yeah. Deliver- yeah. Well, I get I guess, you know, um, if you meet an entrepreneur, you they're a certain kind of person, right? So um yeah. and that's that's really what I've always been. I mean, I was in I was in rock bands in college, you know, and halfway through I had to I hadn't picked a major yet. <laughs> My dad was an accountant, so I thought, well, he's paid the bills, so I guess I'll pick accounting. And so I, I was really always bent towards just a, an extreme curiosity yeah, and okay. creative side, which is what you're going to find in an entrepreneur. And yeah. so yeah. 
I, so even going into larger firms, I've always thought they don't do this right. I could do this better. You know, <laughs> a lot of wrong thinking uh, with young entrepreneurs. And so have always been trying to do things. And, you know, when you're real young as an entrepreneur, you're all you think about is I've got to start my own business. I've got to do something. Um, and so finally, my dad started his firm and I said, I'm leaving the firm I'm at. I want to come lead your firm. He's like, come on. And so that was my chance, right, to step in and actually start acting like who I really always have been. Um, and that's when I started really practicing things, even started, you know, my, you know, my own other companies uh, didn't didn't do well at those because I didn't understand a lot of the foundations of of companies, but did start other companies that are still thriving and growing. So I think that was always just part yeah. of who I was. Um, and and then being creative and curious in that way, you start to just, you know, you see things differently. You go, I can solve that. Or why is nobody solving that? Or they have this problem and yeah. you try to you try to price it. You learn by pricing your market, these services. So we've just done that so long. Um, and I've had to go through my own struggles, you know, of how to run a company and actually, you know, what does it mean to run two full time companies? That's a lot of work on me yeah. and my family. Yeah. And uh, so I, I've leaned into that and have learned a lot of those productivities uh, myself and can apply a lot of that learning to other people. So it's just really who I've always been, you know, which yeah. you, you probably understand. <laughs> so. Yeah, I do. And I think a lot of, you're, you're right. I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs, founders are that, like, I'm curious, what did you play? Bass. Bass? Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I do feel like, um, I've met a lot of founders that come from creative, like whether they yeah. were musicians or, yeah. you know, in the arts somehow, I think that there is a, like they find an area of expertise and then it's almost like they bring in that cre creative element of like yeah. problem solving, which they, yeah. I think it's almost like a compromise with themselves of like, I'm going to find the art in this. Yeah. You know I mean? And it's like that, that's like, it becomes like the, um, the secret sauce of how they end up going about it. And also if you've been in the arts, you also know how to fail miserably. Right. Which, you know, I think, I think <laughs> you know, that's, that's a, that's a great like soft skill to actually have as an entrepreneur yeah. because it's so critical for you to be able to do that and still pick yourself up and have the wherewithal to keep doing it over and over again. Yeah. Um, well, I, and that's, it, that's the way a band is, you know, I was yeah. in, bands and it is it was a six member band and you start to do shows and you have to learn to be in a community with these people and y'all have different skills and you disagree and uh it's just extremely creative and you're in yep. front of people you fail you mess mess the song up you got to start over you feel like crap i mean all that all that stuff happens and then it's that's really a a prediction of what uh, uh, entrepreneurship is like it and so i think that creative curious side really just drives entrepreneurs to go, I don't like doing it this way. I don't want to, I want to do it different. And so they go try something and you, you fail forward obviously, but then you do hit something and you go, Oh, I know how to do this, mm -hmm. but it, boy, it's a path of learning. Sometimes that's pretty painful path yeah. for, obviously we, we hear a lot of entrepreneur stories and what they fail, but it is what makes us who we are for sure. Yeah. And I'm curious now, like, you know, when you do work with the aid with agencies, right. It's like, they are also entrepreneurs in their own right. Mm -hmm. um, but I also, I mean, depending on what kind of agencies that they're running, I think like, you know, a design agency or, you know, creative agency of some sort um, maybe lacks some of that business acumen mm -hmm. uh, to kind of come, you know, like they started off on that very much creative side and like, we're really great at it. And maybe that's how they ended up like just organically building a strong book of business and sure. then outgrew it, what they can do by themselves. Yeah. Um, I can see where there's that, that business acumen gap where they need help to yeah. it's gotten out. It's become a beast of its own and it's like out of their own hands. Yeah. Is that what you most commonly see? Or is it more so of like, cause I would think like a digital agency where somebody is constantly like doing this testing and all that kind of stuff. Like, there may be a little bit more, you know, in tune to the idea of like how to scale. I'm, yeah. I, I'm guessing here. So yeah. based on your experience, kind of like what are the yeah. personality types that you feel like typically you end up bringing the most value to? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's a good point with service-based organizations. We typically find some kind of technically trained 
skilled, mm-hmm. some, an accountant, yeah. engineer, architect, you know, designer, developer, all, all of these skills can turn into businesses. And yeah. so there's always that gap, you know, cause you have really a technician that is good at the technical part of what they do. But if, but if they start, if they have this entrepreneurial bent, they start to do that technical skill on their own. And then a book of business grows around them and you have to develop the skill of scaling a service organization. So I think that business acumen is a gap for probably every technician. Some Mm -hmm. can get it more easily than others, but that's part of what we teach, you know, creative agency owners. And typically if they're hitting 40 and 50 team members, they've had to, they've had to face themselves and move away from the tech technical part. You know, the CEO is not creating anymore. Uh, they may double as a chief creative officer or something like that, but they've, they've had to move away from it at that point, the business forced them to do it. Um, but I think generally that's why we love working with service-based organizations because those technicians all they all struggle with a lack of business acumen not only about running their own business which is leadership team building but there's a whole market facing value positioning pricing and even we all struggle with that agencies struggle with their own positioning right taking a certain uh leaning into a certain niche they also struggle with that but but that makes sense because the things we can help other people do are the things we still struggle with ourselves. And that's just, yeah. that's just how that works, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's so, it's so weird, you know, yeah. I but think it's, it's common. Like, yeah. It's so common. I think it's because I remember this too, running an agency is like, cause you think about like, you're turning away all this potential business. And so right. you fear going into that niche because you don't think it's large enough when, mm-hmm. you know, you, 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 <laughs> It's the the proof is in the the pudding of like people show time and time again of like when that actually right. works and yeah. it's just hard to pull the trigger sometimes on your own. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you and you find what's really embedded in that is this entrepreneur is is leading through fear, right? Which is, I mean, being your own entrepreneur, fear is a is a big part of the game, right? It's you know battling yourself and your fear. So it doesn't matter if you position other companies creatively, you're still going to struggle because the lens you put on in your own business is a lens sometimes yeah. of your own struggles, your own fear. And so a lot of what we're doing in consulting is pushing, helping people face themselves, right? Yeah. And go, you know, who do you think you are running this agency? And they face their own fears a lot of times, and we have to push them into it. Um, yeah. But when they do, they see, they they see, you know, kind of how they're hurting themselves, and then we we help them. We know that they can do it, and then we give them tools and structure and some guidance to actually build a business, build a company, which is what they yeah. need learning of how to do. Yeah, um, I know you, you said you did a you do assessments. You know, is there typically like a framework of how you end up working with these companies? Because I would imagine like it. You're talking about again, like the forty to fifty person teams. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Like bringing in department leaders and then yeah. bringing out, you know, legacy processes, and you know, I think that's like the fear. I think for almost like every agency is, or every like a lot of the service based businesses is like, how do you scale the same quality of service if you were the person that was primarily running that serve or delivering yeah. that service, right? And it's almost like that fear of, you know, is the quality going to consistently be there? But that's where it requires you to build process so that it can be scaled in a way that it instills a similar quality, right? And yeah. And that. Yeah. And that's where that's where we're helping them. Le- There's a phase at which they have to learn how to become leaders, too. Mm-hmm. And so there, there are very basic principles, you know, of leadership. And you're going to find leaders... Are, they're they're starting to hire people smarter than them, right? They're they they have embraced. Sometimes we'll get people to say, "Label yourself the CEO," and and that's just a little trick we use because they struggle even with labeling, self identifying as the leader of the business. But at forty and fifty, they've leaned into that. So and so now what they're doing is leadership. That's their job. And so we teach them what leadership is. It is the development of people. It's how to communicate and message in a kind, truthful way to their team and helping the leaders they've installed also communicate the same way. And so at that point, they're 
they've moved away from technician, you know, which is good. And they've moved into a leader. And as a CEO, we can teach them that you have to have a vision. You have to state that you need a sentence. You need, you've got to make that statement to your team every year. You know, there's patterns to this behavior. Uh, leaders are always creating more leaders. Those are things we want to see in patterns of leaders' lives. Um, so we, so when they're running a pretty larger established business, that's when they're having to practice the art of leadership, which super hard. Like it's, it's difficult for us to even identify what the heck a leader is. Right. Yeah. But in a service organization, you are really uh, kind of serving other people, helping them come up as leaders too. So that's a big part of what they do. Now it doesn't have anything to do with being a technician at all yeah. at some point. Yeah. You know? Makes sense. Yeah. Um, I want, I want to cover this too. Is like, you know, how, how has the landscape shifted? Cause I'm sure you've gone through and seen different, you know, different cycles, different evolutions, phases mm -hmm. doing this for such a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, what's kind of been the, the latest evolution of things and like how the landscape what what's like what's keeping you up at night around this yeah this space like yeah the past the past year going into this year going into tomorrow you know what are some of the things that you're thinking about your clients are thinking about yeah uh, well it's um yeah since the pandemic it it is a little troubling to see um agency owners are struggling enough they're really starting to some are starting to give up <laughs> they're and and you get it they're worn out you know after the pandemic and now you know economics are really weighing heavy on them really for the past couple of years uh agencies have really struggled and the agency owners are just they're worn out you know they're really worn out especially ones that have done this a while yeah. um so it's it's hard you can't really encourage them to keep going because they're like no i'm done um, and it started back even before the pandemic when a lot of them were running businesses. And this can happen in good economic times. You can actually run your business in a poor way because there's plenty of business. The labor's not as expensive. Just some very specific, you know, macroeconomic principles that allow you to run your business in poor ways. And then when you lose all of your client base during a pandemic and the government funds that. Uh, what we found is a lot of our agency clients, you know, they used all that money that some of that money was debt. You know, so there was some free money from the government, but some of it was just, you know, straight out loans to, to anybody <laughs> just fill out the form and they did it. So what they did is they got into a lot of debt, but they didn't change the model of their nice. business. And so they they floated through the pandemic and now we're hitting some harder economic times for agencies, which are really they're tip of the spear in our economy, right? When our economy struggles, people are pulling back spend on market, creative, you know, media, those kind of things. So they shut that that expense down pretty quickly. But now here's the agencies. They're, they're strapped with debt. You know, they, get, they got huge debt uh, to the government. Um, they're very fearful of letting go of their team and readjusting team sizes. The revenue is struggling. Uh, the pricing is difficult now. You know, people are not paying appropriately valued prices in our economy. Um, and so they're tired, you know, and that that's hard to see. I mean, it's our it's our niche. So that kind of sucks. Right. <laughs> so we've developed some other niches, too, uh, that we're considering as we kind of pivot and change. But um, we, we want to stay with these creative business owners. And a lot of them are just selling. And, mm. you know, pr private equity is allowing them to exit. Uh, mm -hmm. sometimes not for the money that they should be, but they're just, they're like, I don't care. I just get me out of this. Give me a million bucks and I'm gone. And yeah. that's kind of sad, but yeah. that's what happens. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. I mean, I'm curious as to what your thoughts are here, you know, as it relates, obviously the topic of AI and, and that coming into play. Right. I, I mean, I haven't, I, there's definitely a lot of cool, you know, oh, I think like um, gimmicky type of things that you can do with AI right now. And For I think sure. Obviously yeah. There's a there's a power element there, especially like generative AI of what we're talking about, like um, that that you know potentially could be, you know, very disruptive. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't think I've seen it yet where it 
creates parity for human creation creativity yeah. right I, yeah i don't i don't i don't think we're seeing that yet we're we're yeah. we are seeing a lot of agency owners they they are especially the older ones who have done this a while they are feeling a, even a lot more fear around that cuz that yeah. that it, it feels so unknown right yeah you know, but I, and I think there are some gimmicky things and some of the gimmicky things are mind blowing, right? It's yeah, just, <laughs> you see it on Twitter and you're like, oh my God, that is, that is, we've not seen things like that. But I think what we're really seeing the leverage of that generative AI models is really uh, the access to knowledge is, is pretty amazing. Even in our tools like Zoom or we loom a lot of financials, you know, you can turn on those tools and they start to transcript things and summarize things in ways that are just incredible. Yeah. And so it's really, it's just making us faster at knowledge management, which is a big part of scaling a services yeah. company. A services company has to take the contracts, what the client said they want, document it, get paid for it. And then the team go work together and create this deliverable and then get paid for it and deliver it. That's really, uh, you know, the efficiency of that knowledge deliverable. Uh, that's a key. So when we find agencies bogging down, they're bogging down in a lot of how knowledge flows through their company. So there's a lot of chaos if they don't do it well. If there's not documented processes, they're not communicating in meetings on, on appropriate rhythms. Sometimes there's too many rhythms of meetings. Sometimes there's not enough. There's not knowledge being shared and pushed towards a deliverable that shows value to get money for it. So knowledge is, you know, how knowledge is pushed through a services company is huge. It's, yeah. it's, it's a massive way to scale. And AI does aid that. It's aiding that really, really well. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people are not using, you know, chat GPT to do a lot of their writing for them on content. Yeah. Maybe, maybe some, but it is a great research tool. Right. Yeah. It calls the Internet for that research that they need, that creative uh, and content. They do a lot of research around mm -hmm. strategy and those tools do that for you. So it can it does aid in those ways. But I don't I don't think it, it's taking anybody's business. It's just yeah. aiding them to do a lot of that better and faster. Yeah. 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 I think so, too. I mean, I think that there's. Um, there's definitely those that are going to be afraid of it and, and, you know, might distance themselves from it. And mm -hmm. look as like, this is the end of my career or the end of this, this, this service as I know it, or there's going to be those that I think embrace, embrace it in the way that you just mentioned of like, sure. well, this is going to help me be, I can operate as 10 people now. Right. And it can help me, you know, be much more efficient. Mm -hmm. But my, what my thing is my, the, the, the X factor of what I bring still exists and True. I can now use these tools to amplify it. Yeah. Right. That's that's it. Those, there's there's those that think of it that way too. I think that's right. Um, you know, last last few thoughts here, just because I know we're rounding up on time, is just mm -hmm. where do you think your this this space is in the next like two to three years? Like, do you you know, especially the creatives, right? Like, mm. I, I mean, I think I don't know. I can see I can see a lot of different potential avenues, but you know, you, you're so in, ingrained into it. I would love to kind of get your thoughts of like, do you, do you imagine like there's going to be a handful of like really super powerful creatives out there mm. that's going to like really, you know, dominate a whole, huge part of the market and figure mm. out how to leverage all these tools? Or do you think it's going to be dissipated where it's like not, not many out there anymore? Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think we're seeing this in a lot of service industries. There, yeah. there, there is a roll up happening yeah. in some way um so we're starting to see people that get not give up you don't go roll into private equity or some kind of holding company because you're giving up but um we're seeing people be absorbed so i think the larger holding companies are are going to become larger mm -hmm. and some strong entrepreneurs that have a large agency will go buy others. So there'll be this roll up acquisition either through private equity or just, you know, acquisitions of, you know, small business entrepreneurs. And then I think we're going to see some people that remain, you know, staunchly independent. Mm. They're, they're going to be like, no, I'm going to do this on my own. Uh, and so there, there are some that are going to, you know, continue to grow on their own and go through, uh, a lot of the hardships, you know, that it takes. Um, and then a group is going to 
you know, the ones typically selling out, you know, they're, they're just needing to be done. And sometimes that's a lot of the older entrepreneurs yeah. uh, that are doing that. So I think we're still going to have a space of, you know, small independents, but the bigger ones are going to grow a little bit. They're going to get bigger. And then I think the agency space is going to have a lot of private equity ownership. And, you know, typically when they do, when they do a purchase or a roll in, they're going to do a second, uh, second roll up, maybe to a larger, some do that. Some want to hold, you know, the, the businesses they have bought. So I think what, then this year and next year probably are going to be still economically a little bit difficult, you know, because um, an election year is difficult in, in the U.S., probably in all countries, but in the U.S. Um, and we we have some, you know, it's pretty comical in the U.S. kind of what, what we're dealing with economically. So I think a lot of the market is going to struggle this year, probably a little bit through next year, too. So the next couple of years are going to be a little bumpy. Uh, mm -hmm. for services industries, I think. Um, and then after that, I think we're still going to have strong agencies, you know, some independents, the larger ones will be larger. And then there'll be this, you know, private equity holds a lot of these that yeah. they're going to be looking to spin those off probably in the next five years. So there's going to be another, another effort of market change in probably a four or five year period when there's a second spin off to, to whatever they do. What, whatever that that ends up being is what I'm guessing. So, yeah, yeah, I could see it. You heard it here first. I agree. I guess. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you love to make predictions because you know they're going to be wrong. So, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but on that note, I wanted to say uh, thank you so much for taking the time, sharing your visibility, mm -hmm. your insights um, around this world specifically. Yeah. Um, very interesting to me personally, but uh, I think a lot of our Listeners can find a lot of value in it too. So thank Very you. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Chris, for having me. Of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm.